see we have myself going to talk uh, along with Richard, who is uh, IOSH Vice President, and Steph, who is my Vice Chair. We'll then have a bit of a Q&A and we'll cover the IOSH competency framework, which links with today's presentation. Um, although it says 3.30, I reckon we should probably be done by about three, unless somebody's got really good questions they want to come on. Okay. So in the next few months, we are looking at how we can get face-to-face uh, -face meetings within the diary. And we're trying to find some suitable sites in order to be able to do that. Um, and we have got also got the possibility of being a hybrid. Our problem is the size of the facilities and the filming and whatever you to do a proper engaging event to cover both. Um, but we will keep you informed and provide details nearer the time. We're working hard to finalize our forward program to include the mix of face-to-face -face and online meetings. So please look out for the committee mailers and our posts on social media for any further updates. Next. So today we're gonna to start with Richard Bate. He's our IOS Vice President. He's MD of the Institution of Strategic Consulting Limited as well as a consultant with the FIA Formula E World Championship Race Series. Rich has been a paramedic in the NHS and has done things like emergency response, helicopter aircrew training and management. He's also been working at different parts within the NHS. He's a passionate advocate of safety as a first career, and he promotes this through, through the IOSH mentoring scheme and by promoting youth membership and education through the North Wales IOSH Exec Committee. Really enthusiastic about the advantages of truly effective sustainability, enthusiastically powered mobility, autonomous operations, temporary hydrogen power installations, and innovation in sustainability. And something he is unaspiringly vocal about. So, Richard. Wow. Fernanda here, Goglith Cymru. I practiced that. Um, I knew Tudor would be listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, well done. I like that. Then you got myself. I've been involved in Irish South Wales since moving up from Portsmouth over 10 years ago someone who's highly motivated and passionate about health and safety determined to encourage our next generation to understand this can be a rewarding career choice as well as a positive path health and safety isn't about stopping people working but more about enabling others to understand the risk previously chair of the irish rail group i'm on the committee to help provide the opportunity to promote good practice and learning to a wider audience with fewer boundaries and then we have steph my vice chair, health and safety consultant by profession, has been for the last 10 years with a background in environmental health and public health. In her current role, she has, works with existing professionals and those new to the role of health and safety. She joined the branch committee in 2018 and has relished being able to extend this support and engagement to others within the profession, including those entering as new professionals. It's exciting to be part of such a forward thinking branch who put their members at the heart of what we set to achieve. So, say hello, Steph. Okay, Richard, over to you, sir. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'll, I'll speak in English now. Welsh is definitely not my first language, although I've, uh, I've lived in Wales for all of my 60 years. Um, and, you know, I'm really honored that you've invited me uh, to, to just share my my journey with you this this afternoon um it's it's a very personal journey and it, it takes me from early days uh, in, in events back in the 1980s through to being um one of your vice presidents um i'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on but um yeah to, to be a vice president uh, and to be with you this afternoon uh, you know it, it's really humbling so thank you for this invitation so 
um, what does you know volunteering mean to me? Um, uh, well, I know what it means to my wife and to my family. It means that uh, other than working 60, 70 hours, you know, a, a week, um, in which I, you know, I'm not necessarily proud of, but uh, it's just the, the the role I have within the events industry. I also give up probably 10 hours a week as a, as a volunteer. Um, begs the question why, but hopefully in 10 minutes time, you'll understand. So next slide, please. Now, I genuinely started volunteering straight out of straight out of high school. Um, I finished my A levels, and I literally got on my little one two five motorbike and I rode up to Bala in North Wales, um, and I I spent two weeks there as a as a volunteer um, at the World Canoe Championships. And to be quite honest, it's never really stopped. What you will see through uh, through through this session, there is a link. Um, and, and the link for me all the way through uh, my volunteering career and my professional career um, is motorsport. Um, so very, very early on, probably even before 1981, I'd started uh, volunteering as a, a marshal in motorsport. Uh, I'd started to compete at that point as well. Um, but then I, you know, I had to grow up. I, uh, I, I found a role within the NHS. I had no idea I was going to end up in the NHS as a, as a paramedic. I had even less idea that I would end up um, as a flight paramedic eventually. But one of the things that I realized very, very early on is that when I joined the NHS, I needed older colleagues to support me and guide me through the process. Um, I had no idea. So when, you know, a few years later on, when I was asked by my line manager, would I be interested in working with some students and helping them through the system? Um, obviously, I said yes. But then I realised what you know what the benefits were from working with um, you know working with a, as an advocate, if you like. Uh, and it's not just you know it, it's definitely not just a one way thing. This for me, it's always been about what I can learn from the people that I'm working with. Um, and, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, I've, I've done a lot of work. Um, around the around Motorsport UK and and the FIA, the world's governing body, um, particularly in the early days around uh, rescue and response. But more more seen more recently because of my age, uh, I've become a senior international official with with the FIA, and that fits in with my job with with Formula E. What I think is really important, um, you know, for this afternoon and, and what we really should be talking about is 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 what benefits I've got. Um, from IOSH and the work I've done with the North Wales branch, um, probably from 2007. Um, I, I, North Wales branch is, um, is, is a very proactive branch. It, it, it's like your branch, it covers a large area. Uh, and, you know, we've got Paul looking after us, which is, which is fantastic, keeps us on the straight and, straight and narrow. Um, but, you know, we, 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 all of our branches are facing challenges uh, and, you know, the, the, the energy and the drive um, to keep the branches alive comes from us so you know, we should we should recognize the uh, the contribution that we all make to 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 keep um to keep the energy and the dynamism alive within it with you know, at our branch network level um and i, I quite quickly with iosh with, with north wales branch i quite quite quickly joined the committee um i joined the committee i think at the same time as a uh, as, as richard bladen who's our current chair um and you know we all find that we've got unique talents or in my case you know i'm just a i'm just a person who's jobbed around so i've, I've built that experience over the years um but what, what i found with north wales is that i'm really good at bringing in speakers um i, I travel a lot I, I meet a lot of really interesting people so that became my role within north wales um and again even though uh, I hadn't worked within the NHS for probably 20 years when during the pandemic I um, you know I volunteered to go back uh, I started off by crushing boxes and mopping floors and wiping chairs down and then eventually they realized that I, uh, I was a former paramedic and I, I started um, I started to be a vaccinator um, and while all that was going on um, another colleague uh, from motorsport Stuart Hughes said Look, have a think about a vice president, what you could bring to a, to, a, to a vice presidency role. And I have to say, it's been an absolutely incredible experience. I'm really, really enjoying my time as a vice president. Um, but I'm still going through that phase, even now, six, seven months later, where, um, you know, 
I'm I'm still in a in, in almost in a state of shock because uh, I really didn't expect to get the vice presidency. But because of that, I am I am I am absolutely fully committed to the role. So it's 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 quite an interesting. You know, I started off at a World Canoe Championship, uh, and then you know, almost forty years. Oh, actually, forty years later, I'm you know I'm now one of your vice presidents. So it's been a heck of a journey. Um, next slide. So again, I'm just going to reiterate, this is a personal journey um, and it, you know, everyone's volunteering journey is, is, is different. Um, I love to speak, you know, it's inherent in most Welsh people. Um, I, I think, you know, I think as a, a, the Welsh particularly are good communicators um, and, you know, I enjoy meeting people uh, and what I've, what I've got from volunteering um, for me in no particular order, but building professional relationships, particularly in my, in my industry, in the events industry, where, um, you know, I'm, I'm continuously moving around the world. Um, and I, it's incredibly helpful having all of the right telephone numbers in my, in my phone, so that I know that if I need um, a piece of steel for a structure, um, or I need some more crowd control barrier, or I need, you know, some more security guards. I've I've built those relationships up over forty years, so I know where to go. Um, and it's it's not always about you know professional relationships. You know, you build you, you build really strong personal relationships. Um, you know, in in all of our roles, um, there's there's there's, a, there's significant pressure on on us. You know, in in our world of work, that, that there's been significant change um, in in you know in our work lives due to COVID. Um, it's worth recognizing that, you know, by building relationships, it's not always about, you know, uh, what you can what you can get from that relationship professionally. It's sometimes, you know, particularly, you know, with, with me traveling, um, it's good just to have a friend. So that that is also a, a fantastic advantage of, of, of you know, that I found from volunteering. The other good thing is um, sharing knowledge and ideas. I think I have some half decent ideas, but I, I know that my ideas are based on my experience over over the years. Um, you know, whether that in the early days was as a, a paramedic in the NHS, or you know, in the, the past twenty plus years as a as a health and safety practitioner. But the great thing is that, that by getting yourself involved, um, pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, going to conferences, speaking at conferences, you are going to start to build. Not only you're going to you you know, you're going to become more confident yourself um, but you're also going to start to have discussions with younger brighter people who've got new ideas um, and and they're, they're keen to share those ideas I, I, I will kind of round this off to in a couple of slides time by telling giving you a, a, an example of how this has worked for me um, I when I when I speak to to um, to, to students or when I speak uh, you know I, I guess like many of you um, I, I mentor people through the, um, the the IPD process one of the things that I'm asked is how do you get to where you are how do you go from being a paramedic in North Wales to being a um, you know a motorsport consultant how, how, how does that work um, and for me it's been really simple and there's two reasons for it I've always walked through every door that's presented itself to me and I've got an incredible wife who's allowed me or she's indulged me for more than 30 years and has allowed me to travel um, and, and, and have these incredible life experiences so th there's more to it than just you know yes it's great I can go off and do what I want that there, there is uh, I, I recognize that there's a there's um, on, you know, from my, my family's perspective, I recognise that they've made sacrifices as well. So, in in you know, I, I'm 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 just always aware that I, I I respect that 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 commitment that my wife has shown to me. Something that again I won't I won't labour this, but there's there's a book called The Culture Tree. Um, now I know many of you will have travelled widely, um, and something that I I didn't initially didn't initially pick up and I have to say it's probably only 10 years ago that I understood this so every culture is different every culture thinks differently um, you know and it's simple things that I learned up from reading this book um, how you you know after a meeting um, in the west we quite often at the end of a meeting in the west we will just kind of go through what what work streams do we need to cover off what do we need to do and just reaffirming 
what we've discussed during the meeting. You do that in Asia, and you, you particularly with the Japanese culture, they will think, why, why are you repeating this? Why, why are you telling us this? We've just been through this. So I, I learned a lot um, around um, cultural empathy from reading a book. Now I think I'm a better health and safety practitioner because I know how to react to, to different cultures. So, and, and I, again, I love being with people. Um, and I'm definitely going to, you know, hammer home this point. Um, if I hadn't volunteered, if I hadn't been involved in motorsport, if I hadn't been a paramedic and a qualified paramedic um, and, and got myself involved in motorsport volunteering, there is absolutely no way that I would be where I am today. Um, my my name for for, for what it's worth, um, you know, I, I started to, if you like, develop my own brand um, through volunteering, not not as a professional in motorsport. If I hadn't done those hard yards as a marshal, as a, as an official, I would never have had the opportunities that I've got now. Um, and, and personal professional development, um, we've all got a, you know, we've we've all got our um, we've got our plans for how and where we want to be, um, but. Uh, I, something else I want to share, um, you know, I, I, I turned 60 a few weeks ago. My drive to to keep improving, my drive to actually develop my career doesn't feel any different um, to how it felt 20 years ago. I'm feeling a little bit jaded at the moment. I'm actually in my second bout of COVID, um, so I'm not perhaps on the, uh, on, on the best of form. But final point on this slide push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, you get so many benefits from doing it. I didn't initially want to be on the North Wales Committee um, because I thought that was way above my, my competency level. And um, it, it was that initial step through, you know, to, 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 to get onto the committee in North Wales that has led me to be um, a VP. Next slide, please. So what do I get from, you know, from, from, from volunteering, from, you know, being, you know, giving up, you know, quite a lot of my time, uh, as do you guys. Um, and I think I've already kind of made some of these points. Um, volunteering has absolutely changed my life. Um, and I would say that since becoming a vice president, um, that there has been a significant um, change in the opportunities that have become available to me. Um, I find that different people talk to me I find that people want to talk to me I also find that people want my uh what my my thoughts and perhaps even my advice this is a big change for me um and it's it's it I mean it does it gives me an absolutely huge warm glow um and the other thing I, I, I found through 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 volunteering you get to work with some incredible people now I'm going to to, to pick on a person here I mean um some of you may know Alice Jones who's in the uh, as you're looking at it to the to the right of that photograph um Alice was the I believe unless somebody corrects me the youngest ever chartered member of IOSH um she she made that at 23 years of age or she was if she wasn't the youngest ever she was the youngest female um Alice is uh, lives around the corner from from me up in North Wales um, and I've watched Alice grow um, from a young lady who stood in front of me at a North Wales branch four or five years now, four years ago, and said, I want to do what you do. Um, and I've seen her grow. I've seen, I, I saw her finish her, 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 her education. Um, I then helped her in a small way through her IPD process with, with Richard Bladen. And it's absolutely amazing for me to see how she's developed. Um, I mean, if you ask me for one thing that I could take away from this, this, this journey as a volunteer with IOSH, I would probably pick on that work I've done with Alice. Alice, for, for many years, was my, my deputy at Formula E. Um, I'm moving into a new role with a with a new company, and and Alice will fill that slot that I that I've left behind. So I'm incredibly proud. The other the other reason for sharing that photograph with you is that Alice and myself were in Indonesia recently, um, and we got to work with some students from Anchol University who were just starting their health and safety career. So for me, there's that that photograph means a lot to me. That's full circle. That's me having helped Alice over a period of years, and now seeing her grown into a you know a really really competent global um, health and safety practitioner. To seeing Alice working with some students in Indonesia. So there's my big warm warm glow. Um, the other things that you get from it, um, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not. Um, I, I never shy away from this. Uh, the, the the reason I actually made the leap from the NHS into health and safety. Um, is not uncommonly and not uncommon with many um, emergency service professionals, um, uh, health professionals. Um, uh, I suffer from PTSD um, and 
this the changing career the the volunteering work i've done um has allowed me to refocus my career um and, and the, the the volunteering and particularly the mentoring has been huge huge health benefit to to me um because you know you you know quite often you know me me i i certainly feel this that many of my mentees have become really good friends um uh, so that, that that's a that's perhaps a side issue that you may not necessarily have thought about raising your professional profile um yeah you know i think it is important that we we keep you know we you know certainly for me keeping linkedin up to date doesn't do any harm if you're if you if you're on a branch committee or um you're a member of one of iosh's professional groups um or you push yourself all the way up you know to, to being a vp or, or or sitting you know standing for for council um it will bring you back more than you have ever can ever possibly conceive um and as i said earlier on you know professional development doesn't stop when you get a bit older um i, I absolutely assure you that my drive to succeed is no different now to it was 20 years ago and in fact um i i know that i'm coming towards the end of my career now so i'm i am really pushing um to make that next big professional step so for me it's a whole holistic approach um i have definitely got back a hundred times more from my work with IOSH as a volunteer than I've ever given. Uh, and I, and I, I, I can't recommend, I can't recommend it enough. Just walk through that door that opens itself, that when it presents itself, put yourself outside of your comfort zone. And I promise you, you will reap the benefits. Um, and the the next slide, if you um, any of you want to reach out to me um, through the presidential team, um, by all means, drop me an email. Um, I'm pretty prevalent on on LinkedIn. Um, but equally, um, just have a look at what the presidential team do. And you know, you know, maybe this time next year, you you might you might fancy standing. Um, and you know, you could you could find yourself on the presidential team with an old bloke from North Wales. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Richard. Um, Paul, did you want to run one of the polls? Also, if anyone's got any questions, uh, anything based on what Richard's already said or anything you know, generally around uh, volunteering, pop them in the chat and just make sure it's for uh, everyone so we can see it. Okay, so we've got most people are completing the poll. So uh, I just, just to clarify that, Keith, so if that's uh, volunteering in any sort of capacity, is Yes. Yeah, yeah, just so not necessarily just in an IOSH capacity, any form of volunteering. Okay, so we're nearly there, so we'll... Uh, We'll end the poll and we'll just share it on the jump. Let's share this, the results on screen. Yeah, please. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay. thank you. So why do we see it as a needle in the haystack? Quite often, people struggle to say or see what volunteering would best suit them and so they're looking beyond sometimes the obvious uh, just being part of, of the irish committee is volunteering actually being an active part is part of the commitment but there's plenty of opportunities out there and as you'll see from mine mine's totally different from the way richard did it if you want to go on the next slide, please, Steph. So my journey I started back in British Rail in 1981 as a trainee electrician. I decided I wanted a career being an electrician and uh, started with BR. In 1984, the railways decided they didn't want me with their modernization back then. And they cut down the number of people they wanted and they closed the depot I was working at. So I went off to work for an electrical wholesaler, still doing electrical work and still being involved in the electrical thing. I then got approached by a company that did vehicles, um, but they did ambulances and that sort of vehicle. And uh, 
So I, I moved into doing more of a fitting role, but doing the electrics in order to fit generators and things like that to uh, ambulances and service vehicles. While I was doing that, my father had an accident in the dockyard. And it was probably a really pivotal point in my career. So my father was a painting inspector and he worked in Portsmouth and a ship came in like the one you see in that and they drained the water out and my father went down to inspect it so to do that he had to climb down that ladder you can just see on the side of the picture um, as he went to climb down so the person who was proposed to have cleaned the ladder of the seaweed and everything else hadn't actually done their job and he slipped on seaweed and fell to the bottom of the dry dock. And uh, that put him in hospital. In fact, he ended up in hospital for more than six months and never worked again. And that really struck a chord. You know, how could somebody do that? How could somebody not take the care? What would make somebody not take the time to close that off and, and just block it because there is a proper chain that they can put across and sign that says still needs cleaning to not do that and i struggled with that for quite a while so i thought how can i make a difference what can i do that would help stop somebody doing that and that's how i got into health and safety so how does that tie into volunteering? So my journey with IOSH, I then started with the NEBOS training, which I went and then completed. I joined IOSH, because obviously that's the next step. But I also volunteered as a Samaritan and actually started talking to people, or more importantly, listening to what people were saying. And I didn't realise how much that would do for me or help me. I then went back to college and completed my diploma. And I just carried on with being a Samaritan. And I then started volunteering as well at a heritage railway. Something I actually do right up till today. I then went off to university and studied and did my MSc in occupational health. I then gave up Samaritans um, for other reasons, um, partially for moving away from the area and also having done it for nine years, um, it was starting to get to the point where I didn't think I was offering any more and uh, decided that I'd go off and do other things. Um, and at the same time, I, I went off and was invited or asked to go to IOSH to go over to Kazakhstan um, to help advise the Kazakhstan railways on ways they could improve as a volunteer, unpaid. So I had a week in Kazakhstan, came back, and because of the work I'd done with the uh, railway group and that, I was awarded the President's Distinguished Service Award. So I gobsmacked, didn't expect it. I thought, you know, this is the sort of thing that everybody wanted to do, you know, get to foreign visit, foreign countries, see different cultures and everything, all for via volunteer. And then last year, I achieved my Charter Fellowship, probably the biggest tick in the box under the Irish banner. And now, still a volunteer, and I'm chair of your branch. So I'm still involved, still keeping that thing. And just like Richard says, the enthusiasm hasn't waned in any way. I still want to make and keep people as safe as I can, whether that's at work, in volunteer sector, or at home. Keith, just a quick question. Um... I think, you know, there may be people on the call who think, well, I'm not a volunteer, but, you know, it's something that 
you know, I maybe want to get involved in. There's often that trigger, isn't there? There's either something that happens or, you know, it gets presented to you or someone mentions it and you think, oh, actually, um, was there anything in particular that, you know, you encourage you to sort of go and work for the Samaritans and volunteer? Was that, what was that, what did that look like for you? So for me, the Samaritans, yes, there was uh, a friend of mine ended up in trouble, um, decided they wanted to take their own life. And that made me think about it and looking for help for them brought me into contact with the Samaritans in order to help them. And again, it, it goes back to that. What could I do to help somebody who was in that position? Was there more I could do? And so I felt volunteering for Samaritans and actually being able to take that call gave me that added advantage. And even to this day, you know, I still am a mental health first aider. I still get involved in raising money for Samaritans and helping their cause. And so, you know, just because I've stepped back from being uh, a, a phone answerer, shall we say, doesn't lower my passion in any way for what the Samaritans do and what they stand for. So, yes. Okay, that's fine. Good question. Okay. Okay, you can take a, you can take a breath now. It's on to me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been pretty quiet all along, mainly because I'm clicking through the slides. So I'm going to be sort of uh, multitasking for this part. Um, but uh, I'm Seth. So for those of you uh, who've come across me before, I work very closely alongside Keith and in the IO South Wales branch as uh, vice chair. Uh, my journey is probably a little bit um, less. Well, a bit more boring, I suppose, a little bit more straightforward. But I think the point of today is to show that we all come from different walks. We all have different experiences and different journeys. So um, I, as as uh, mentioned in the in the introduction, um, I come from an environmental health background. Um, and basically, I was a young 18 year old, not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life, um, but knowing that I wanted to do something that I enjoyed and something that perhaps gave me something different every day. And through a suggestion, uh, environmental health came um, as one of those suggestions. I looked into the degree a little bit more and as well as health and safety, you know, it covered things like public health, housing, environmental protection and food safety, as well as public health. Um, so it, it seemed great, you know, someone who didn't really know what they wanted to do. This course offered me a variety um, and, and, and an option then of, of looking at what perhaps I wanted to specialise in. So that was was really good. And also as part of the degree, um, it included a placement year. So I spent a year out in local authority um, as a student environmental health officer. At the time when I did the degree, it was very enforcement heavy. So even though, you know, we talk about health and safety, you were taught about the legislation in from an enforcement perspective. So my experience and my sort of foundations come from looking at things from, uh, you know, this is how, this is what a breach looks like. And, and, you know, this is possibly how to get it right. And I won't lie, health and safety in university in terms of the lectures, probably my least favourite subject. It's probably a little bit drier compared to some of the others. But it wasn't until I did my placement year and actually seeing the practical side and the importance of doing the job in practice and seeing what what one person can do, even from an enforcement perspective, can make a difference and help protect people. And that was the bit I learned that love for that fulfillment of helping people and guiding people. And although I was in an enforcement role, actually enforcers work a lot to educate and work with. Um, and that was the bit that I enjoyed the most. I did a couple of initiatives where, you know, for different parts of environmental health, worked with like schools um, and businesses to try and further educate and get that understanding rather than, you know, just oh, it's the law, you have to comply with it. So bringing it to life a little bit. So I returned to university, a much well-rounded person, professional, someone who perhaps wanted to know what they wanted to do a little bit more. Um, and then I graduated right in the middle of a recession. So a uh, job in local authority and enforcement had pretty much dried up by the time that I graduated. So I then managed to secure a contract um, working with the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health in Wales um, as a policy and research officer. So I was responsible for designing and executing public health research that would then work um, 
to work with local government or to lobby for better regulation. So a couple of examples, I did research on health eating in deprived areas, um, underage and illegal tattooing and, you know, bit of like mystery shopper structuring all of that, taking all the findings and putting a, um, a research paper together on it. So during that time as well, I was also studying for my um, professional registration. So EHRB, Environmental Health Registration Board, you have to be registered um, in that in order to call yourself an environmental health officer. So in order to then go and be a, um, an environmental health practitioner, that was something that I um, achieved, which at the time, I didn't actually realise how much that was going to help me in my journey to chartership um, because I had to do a portfolio, which then mimicked what I needed to do for charter. So actually, I'd laid quite a lot of groundwork and, and that helped me a lot um, in, my, in my later uh, part. Um, and as part of my work with the CIH Wales, I actually got a, a few moments of fame. Um, I was on national radio and the research that I did ended up on mainstream media, um, including a mention by Dr. Hilary Jones on Good Morning Britain or Daybreak, I think it was called at the time. So that was my claim to fame um, way back when before I actually um, got into the role that I am now. So the role I'm in now is a I'm a health and safety consultant. Um, and at the time I joined Tom's Carroll, which is the company I'm with now, I was also, also applying for a job as um, an environmental health officer. And I actually turned down um, a job offer to get the experience of going to work in the private sector, having experienced public sector for a little bit, um, and sometimes some of the challenges of that. Um, I thought, no, let's, let's take private sector a go. And um, I started off as a graduate and junior consultant um, until I then became a fully fledged consultant when I became chartered. Um, so as part of that, I get to relay my experience of what and how an enforcer thinks. But the difference is I'm not there beating my clients with a stick. I'm going, OK, these are where the gaps are. And here's how we can plug those gaps. And this is how we can work together and work very hard to mentor and support and empower my clients so you know very much not doing it the job for them giving them and inspiring them and, and being there had and holding their hands all the way um, eventually to a point where they go thank you Steph um, we know what we're doing now uh, off you go and I almost think that's a job well done for me so again it's that helping people um, and it's being able to give back uh, as, as well as it's my job um, it's something that I feel that um has led me to to sort of where I am now. So in terms of my journey through IOSH, so I joined IOSH when I got into my consultancy role, um, which in a minute I'll talk about the wish I joined soon a bit. Um, and at the point when I joined as a consultant, I also started my APD process because I know that I, you know, I didn't want to be a junior consultant for very long. I wanted to be fully fledged. So in order to become chartered, I needed to start that process. The reason I say that I wish I had joined sooner is because from a IPD perspective, I was only able to use the information and experience once I had joined IOSH. So all my stuff I'd done as a student environmental health officer, all the stuff prior, I wasn't actually able to use that in its entirety in my APD process. So I encourage people, you know, even at student level, become a member of IOSH because it the sooner you start that journey of even just being a member can really help you in, in the long run. Plus, you have access to, you know, CPD and, and other members as well. But actually, that's definitely one of the things that had I known about IOS sooner, that would have been something I would have loved to have done. Um, so it just meant that my APD process was a little bit uh, more challenging. Plus, it was a bit more challenging because as a consultant, I'm not there at the call face implementing. I'm on the sidelines. I'm advising, I'm training, I'm supporting. So in terms of completing some of the criteria for my IPD and that journey to Chartered, um, that took me uh, quite a lot longer than I originally um, anticipated. So I had to think outside the box a little bit and I had to think about perhaps less typical ways of achieving um, what I needed to do. But during that process, um, I actually applied to be, I applied for a mentor with IOSH um, and at the time didn't actually find or didn't get much success from that process. So it, that's one of the reasons eventually why 
um, I, I joined the mentoring scheme, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I eventually got through my IPD and I became a chartered member back in 2015. And what that also meant is then I could join the Occupational Safety um, Safety and Health Consultants Register, or OSHA for short. So that means not only am I chartered, um, but I'm also, you know, qualified, I suppose, in terms of, of giving um, appropriate advice. Um, so that is really helpful. So OSHA, for those of you who perhaps haven't come across it before, it's basically a bit of a badge that says you're a certified professional to uh, by a recognised body. You basically ensure to give the advice that you are, but you know you are up to date in, and, and, and competent in terms of, of what you do. So you know that's been very very useful. It's helped to, to sort of help with the confidence element, but obviously in terms of the role that I do. And then I became an, an IOSH trainer. So part of my role is, is supporting and mentoring and training people. So being able to deliver the, the IOSH course and again, just acting as that, providing um, good information and training people on their, on their way is something that I really relish and I really enjoy training. And I did a lot of environmental protection, noise complaints, prosecutions during my student year. Um, so I had a lot of enforcement background and substantial knowledge around noise itself, but, you know, through our own growth processes, um, occupational noise was something that I wanted to delve into a little bit further. So I actually became a noise risk assessor um, after that. And then, as Keith already mentioned, in 2018, I joined the IOSH Southwest branch. Now, prior to this, so I was approached at the Southwest Alliance conference by one of the prior members of the committee who said, oh, you know, we just got chatting, oh, you, sh you should join. And my perception of the IOSH branch was you had to be at least chartered, you know, there was a certain level and similar to what Richard was saying, I suppose, in terms of when he joined the North Wales branch, you know, is it out of my competency? What am I really going to add to the committee? But actually, and similar to what Richard and Keith were saying, it's probably been one of the most fulfilling things that I do. And you know, it's when you say to someone that you volunteer, what, why? Well, because I really enjoy giving back. I really enjoy being part of it. And one of the things that has been really refreshing and something that I wanted to make clear to, to anyone on the call really is to be part of these things. You haven't got to necessarily be the top of your game or a charter because actually you could bring something just as valuable at your point in your journey and actually having a mixture of people makes it a much well-rounded process and that's something that you know if I look at the committee now versus when I first joined we've got a much better demographic of of committee members and it you know hopefully and I I mentioned it in my little bio is I, I feel excited to be part of a very forward-thinking branch because we are trying to be you know what could we do to be better what could we do to be different what do our members really want and we're just trying to tune in as much as we can and it comes from that passion and it comes from that drive of just caring about people and wanting to help and I think that's probably the underlying trait that we all have to a certain extent you know we know yes there's a there's an element of prof professional development and you know you can say you're on the Irish committee but that's a very small part of what actually the benefit is being there being a help and actually feeling like you're part of something so for me you know I've been on the committee since 2018 and I haven't really looked back um, in that respect and then Again, not really knowing that I could apply to be a mentor. It was during 2020 and we were locked down that someone said, oh, yes, yeah, really easy to become a mentor. And given my own experience with the IPD process, again, thinking, well, I wouldn't want someone else to have the same experience that I did with my APD. So if I can just help one person, one person in their IPD process, I go away happy girl. So I became an Irish mentor. Um, and, you know, it's not something that's short lived. You can have that relationship ongoing, similar to what Torichi was saying. You you develop quite a good relationship. Um, so, you know, that that's really been something, again, I've, I've liked to give back to. And then as of last year, was voted to be vice chair and second to Keith on the uh, on the Irish South Wales branch. So, again, just having that extra little step up and having a bit more of a a voice and a, and a role in terms of structuring things again it's just been something really really fulfilling so you know for me my volunteering has been predominantly in the health and safety world um and even that has just been great so i would you know absolutely replicate what what the guys have already said in terms of if you're thinking about it 
do it and it's so easy to do now as well there's so much available online that you can you can find out and, and join and you know put yourself forward for and we've actually got one member of our committee um lana i think she's actually on the call today you know she'd never really she'd never met any of us she'd never come across the committee in person because of the pandemic and she put herself forward for the committee and she's on it and she's a lovely asset that we've got so you know it's definitely something that we encourage everyone to get involved with so what's next who knows do i mention the f word and fellow maybe <laughs> who knows <laughs> okay keith i'm gonna pop that back to you now <laughs> So one of the questions we get asked a lot is where do we fit within IOS? So IOS, 49,000 members, 193 countries. So the world really is your oyster. And when you look at it, we're one of seven branches within a region within IOS. There's 43 branches in total. There's 18 specialist groups. You've also got the Future Leaders Programme. On the other side of that, you've got the No Time to Lose campaign. They're always looking for people to speak up about things like asbestos. You've got the Chief Exec and the Senior Leadership Team. They're the only part that isn't volunteer. But the Board of Trustees, the IOSH Council, and the Presidential Team are all volunteers. So when you look at that puzzle, as I say, the world's your oyster. There's only one part that you can't do as a volunteer. Everything else relies on volunteers. Next slide, please. Do you want to talk through this one or do you want me to carry on? You can carry on. So what do I ask South Wales branch do? Well, we have 1,155 members within the branch. So part of our thing is to arrange a host, a suitable range of events that will help with CPD and IPD, as Steph mentioned. We have regular committee meetings to review inquiries and any feedback on events. We plan future meetings and speakers. And Richard sounds like a really good person to talk about to get more speakers in from different backgrounds. Uh, we promote IOS groups and the No Time to Lose campaign. We help to influence branch growth and development. So we look at areas, and I'm very keen on this, uh, student members bringing in the next generation, not only to i want to say replace ourselves but as we age so we need the younger generation to be involved and it is a case of moving on and as steph said when you get to meet people like lana who've got that passion it's it's great to see it is a huge focus and it does bring a smile to your face to know there are people who are just as committed as you that are so much younger that will take this forward that will take IOSH forward and also giving their time to be a volunteer. And that then brings you into collaboration with others. So we do do a lot of collaboration with other peace people, with other branches, hence the joint events and with groups where we can. It's been a little bit limited during COVID obviously. The IOSH groups, there are 18 industry specific groups are supported and driven by committees and they're all volunteers. Uh, the groups bring together members with shared interests or a specialist area to network and exchange information. So I'm in the railway group, as we said. Steph is in the consultancy group. Tudor is in the education group. And Dylan and Mark are in the construction group. They are all our top people from within our branch. All right. And I'm sure that other members will also be in other branches. So do you fit into an IOS group? So within your thing, within your membership, you've got access to the groups. So how are you actually involved? So if you think you can't cover one or you're not involved in one, have a look through the list. We have aviation and aerospace, environmental and waste management, rural industries, fire risk management, logistics and retail, 
food and drink industries, the theatre advisory group, health and social care, public services, the broadcasting and telecommunications. Then we have construction, the consultancy group, the education group, financial services, the railways, hazardous industries, offshore, and even sports grounds and events. So it's massive, it covers a huge range. Another volunteering opportunities. You don't have to fit in with it within just the IOSH part. You could be co-opted into a branch committee group or stand for election within the branch. We recently had our elections and hence Lana was one of the new people to join. You can volunteer for group committees. We often have committees that look at things on how to uh, advance or to do special things and one of the things we're highly pushing at the moment is the student membership so we're always looking for people to be co-opted to that and Steph would be very pleased I'm sure to hear for any volunteers who want to be involved in that. Volunteer to help the Irish Council or stand for election into the Council. Richard said about the, his volunteering and getting involved in that. Be a mentor help others to progress. So again, like Steph, I'm also a, a volunteer mentor and I believe Tudor is too. So a great way of helping others. Volunteer for peer review. So if you've re just passed up onto the, your next grade, you've probably got all the experience in getting to that grade that you need. Take it back become a volunteer for peer reviews and help membership because they're always looking for that experience. So really the whole world is in your hands. The volunteering opportunities will exist worldwide and that experience will help you develop in more ways than one. As I said, my Samaritan volunteer, the actual listening and communicating was huge. I didn't realize just how important it was teamwork or volunteers always work in teams it's very rare you volunteer on your own so that brings a whole new thing about teamwork and that brings in social understanding being able to talk to people listening to different views and having an empathy with people you probably don't get without doing some volunteering it also brings a level of self-motivation and gains experience. But most of all, it helps you shape the face of health and safety of the future. So, my challenge to you, you're the needle, find your haystack or find your needle to volunteer. Everyone has the experience that they can share. Anybody can be a volunteer. It just takes a little bit of your time. Before we move on to just covering the competency slides, um, Paulie, we able to just share the second poll for us, please. Okay. So given all the... So given all that you've heard this afternoon, has that been enough to inspire you to uh, consider volunteering? Okay, that's good for me just to come through. I'll share on screen, shall I? Yes, please. I'd like to think the 18% knows because you're already volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, there's obviously, you know, there's a time and a place and it's got to be, you know, right, isn't it? So, you know, it's, there are always reasons why sometimes we can't, but as Richard was saying, sometimes there's, if there's an open door, why not walk through it and see how it goes? And the other thing is, of course, you never know where volunteering opportunities will take you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tuda, I think, was going to come on to just run through the competency framework stuff. So, I you know, as part of all of our... 
part of all of our events, we go through the competency slide. So for CPD, we link that to the, the competency framework. So Tilda's going to look at that for us this afternoon. Tilda, over to you. Okay, thanks. I, I just I'll do that. Yeah, very. I'm look, looking forward to it as well. Thank you, everyone else. I'm just gonna just give people a, a, my my little experience of of volunteering because I started at 21. I joined a, a fraternal organisation called uh, Round Table for everyone that might have heard of it, and it's very much a social organisation, but gave me a huge opportunity in charitable and community service work, which I continued for 30, 35 years as part of that organisation. But what's more, it introduced me to chairing meetings, to speaking, to being a secretary, to being a treasurer, to organising. And I never realised until much later life how much those skills would, would help me. Uh, when it came to IOSH, um, yes, I was used to mentoring, if you like, uh, as an educator in my day job. But when it came to joining the branch, like, a bit like Stephanie, I, I didn't know what was involved in the branch. I was a member for many years. And... Um, I found out when I joined that uh, I, I could reflect very much on what Stephanie said about uh, what you needed to be charted. I think there was also a very unfortunate side of it that uh, you also had to be male to be uh, part of the committee and part of the branch. And it was uh, a lot of grey old men um, who were chartered. So we changed that. I think we've done very well at changing that as well. But at the end of the day, that was part of, of, part of the challenge of volunteering. You know, it isn't just about knowledge of health and safety it's about knowledge of how committees work it's about knowledge of how people react to each other work with each other it's so so much and, and i i just i just bit the bullet and I, once i got started on the branch there was, was a bit like a runaway train really and a bit like richard said uh, you know i've been doing it i've been doing it uh, with with the branch now if you like probably 10 years but um i got drawn into it and, and I, i've never looked back um there is so many opportunities for people much have been outlined with keith and uh, richard and, and and stephanie i won't go back but you know i i like opening doors you know i i like walking through them but i also like opening doors and i think as a mentor everyone's got so much to share you should you should really realize that that everyone can you do not have to wait until you get on the committee you do not have to wait until you're chartered you'd have to be in the branch for so many years everyone's got something uh, something to give and i just encourage everyone that I'm, I'm 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 getting on a little bit now but the opportunities for me are, are, are as great as they ever were uh, and i don't intend uh, to stop so all the younger people out there my you know my job is to fill the gaps uh, the, uh, behind us, and we're all working hard to do that. And uh, the branch is in very good hands in Keith and Stephanie's and Lana's um, uh, Lana's hands as well. Good luck, uh, good luck to everyone. So, if we have a look at the competency slides now, uh, Stephanie, if we could. Okay, so so there's the, um, the 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 competency wheel that hopefully everyone should be familiar with, and I would sort of say that. This is going to have, you cannot underestimate the importance and significance of the need to be familiar with the competence framework, um, particularly in what's coming ahead of us in, in the grade changes and everything um, that, that's coming our way as an organization um, over, the, over the coming years. It's going to have a big role in members' personal and professional development going forward. And everything you need to know about that is contained within these three um, categories. Uh, the, the 12 core areas, which in turn support 69 um, key competencies. Today, we're only going to look at um, a, a few of them relevant to the subject that we've uh, looked at. So um, if we look at um, just leadership and management um, to start off with, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, such a significant part of core competency for, for everyone in their in the, in their day job, um, and what you'll see is that when you're looking at volunteering, you can say, "Say, do I? Will I?" We've had the polls, so where you see two of the core competencies that sit under um, leadership and management, then in teamwork and visible leadership, you know. Vis leadership is visible. You've seen leadership today at different levels from um, fr from the people who have been presenters. Uh, how will you go on that journey? How will you take the first steps towards that? The framework is there to help you support that. Um, it's only represented in part here. You know, they say the core areas, leadership and management is one of those three uh, general criteria. But what you should look at with the companies, you should always take an opportunity to reflect on them 
and reflect in the terms of the topic today. Um, you know, where is where is there synergy with them? Uh, where do they present you with opportunity? How will you move forward? How will you make changes? Look at some of the key those key criteria and ask yourself those questions. So if we could see the next one, please. So when you look at that core competency of leadership management, just look what it says. It's an important factor in developing effective and high levels of performance in occupational safety and health by multidisciplinary teams. Keith, Keith showed very clearly where all the opportunities are there for people to get part. I, I joined the education group some 10, 12 years ago and saw an opportunity to go on the committee, went on the committee five, six years. Fantastic. Yes, it is time consuming but not it is so rewarding. you get so much back and anyone that's on a committee can give you those experiences uh, Keith in particular encouraged me a great deal through his work with the railway committee I learned a lot more about what opportunities I could do so so how can how can others lead and inspire you and how can you improve your uh, abilities there and I would say as well are you a leader can you develop more leadership skills and abilities look at your CPD and look at how to improve strengths and, uh, and weaknesses there there, and how can you help others? And if we can have a quick look at the next one, which is goes on to behavioral competencies, one of the other categories, and obviously working with others is so much about what we've seen uh, today, and you've seen good examples uh, from the presenters. Again, in the context of today, uh, look at the challenges that they present you. How did Richard overcome his issues? What did you learn today from any of the presenters? Are there personal traits like empathy that need working on? Alternative is a strength. How can you use that to benefit others? And then the last slide, please. You know, in terms of personal performance driven by results, what do you want to achieve? What do you see? So you, you, you see how, how the branch is set out as to what Keith is trying to achieve, what Stephanie's want to achieve. I can go back and look at what I wanted to achieve and still go forward. Creating and generating commitment and enthusiasm in others for people to come along. So look at your volunteering journey. Look at where you are on that journey. If you're starting, if you're in the middle, if you're towards the end, there is always something you can pass on to others and benefit from others. Others. And when you're updating your CPD as a result of today, look at your development plan, look at the changes you need to make, look at how you can reinforce your strengths and create new opportunities for yourself and others. Okay, Steph? Lovely. Thank you very much. I think um, you sort of made a point there too, De, that sometimes we get so focused on the end, you know, the, end, the destination, you know, I want to be chartered or I want to be this. And actually the journey is just as important, if not more important than than the destination so I think that's something that you know we, we define our own journey and maybe just taking that second through you know fill out your CPD or thinking about volunteering and think about okay is that something I want as part of my journey oh, absolutely everyone starts somewhere and it's so important to remember where you started and how you started that's Richards was excellent in that respect because say everyone starts somewhere and, and it's, it's got it's got to so um those are you know Okay. Keith, do you so, want me to take the last slide or are you okay? There we go. I was going to say, has anybody got any questions they want to ask? I know, I think we've lost Richard, but mm -hmm. uh, Steph, Tudor and I are here. If anybody wants to ask a question, feel free to open your mic and ask away. I haven't noticed anything coming in from the chat. I think it's just more, there's been a lot of comments with people saying what volunteering either they have done or they're currently involved with. So that's nice to hear. Not all of it is strictly health and safety related. Um, I know some people have shared a couple of links and stuff. So, you know, feel free to have a look and, and take a look at those as well. And as I said, volunteering is not just about IOSH. You can also volunteer outside of IOSH. And I proudly volunteer at Glen Eckley and Minif Mauer Railway. Um, we're always looking for people who want to come down and help. So if you're interested in railways and community work, then we're always pleased to take new volunteers. So meeting feedback survey, please take time to complete the short post event survey. Your feedback's truly valued. And we use it to help shape future events. There is a QR code there and there is the survey monkey link. Okay. Just 
stay connected, keep up to date. Iosh.co.uk, that's South Wales branch. Or you can email us at southwales at iosnetworks.com. Or you've got the LinkedIn link. Or you can even use Twitter. Uh, most of our meetings are on Zoom. So we'll publish the links to those as soon as we've got the details for our next branch event. Thank you very much on behalf of the branch for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed it. And we look forward to seeing you all at future events.